Hello and welcome to today's Unicon webinar, Understanding the Implications of the Digital Generation. My name is Rob Deedle. I'm a director at MIT Sloan Executive Education, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. We're glad you're joining us as we cover a very important topic today, looking at a study that sheds light on the evolving expectations and experiences of up-and-coming generations and professionals spanning both Generation Z and the Millennials. Today's webinar will focus on research that came out of a report looking at executive education for a digital generation. We're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Joyce Kerpiers leading us through today's program. Joyce is a senior account manager and consultant for Percept Research, the firm that conducted the survey. Also on the line today, we have Monica Sacristan, who is the Dean of Executive Development and University Extension at ETOM and my colleague here at MIT, Meg Reagan, who is a director for executive education. Before we start the webinar, just to cover a few housekeeping points, today's webinar will be recorded for review later and will be posted to the Unicon website. If you're participating today, you'll receive a link to this webinar recording, and we encourage you to share it with colleagues that may not have been able to, to join us today. Uh, as you look at the screen, hopefully you're seeing the slide deck right now, you also have a navigation panel. We do encourage questions and answers. We'll reserve time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. The way to submit your questions is to use the question panel, which will be relayed to me, and then we'll share those with our group for their responses. Uh, also, just to note, the presentation will be available. It will be posted to the Unicon website after today's webinar. So if you are interested in reviewing the slide deck, that will be available later. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, just mention briefly that today's webinar is in compliance with Unicon's policy for antitrust and competition. We're displaying the statement here for you uh, that this webinar will honor these, these requirements and guidelines that we use for all Unicon events. Uh, we try to host these webinars throughout the year to bring you timely and important information, to share some insight on research that's being done, and to just provide another uh, valuable benefit to Unicon members to connect with, with the wider Unicon membership. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Joyce, who will be leading us through the webinar. Joyce, thank you for all your help, and over to you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here, and especially for this project. This was a very engaging, dense, but very engaging project, and I'm very ho hopeful that there's a lot of a um, lot of very valuable data in here that will specifically help university affiliated exec executive education programs. So thank you for having me. I want to take just a minute. This is very important to put this study into context uh, before we dive in. Um, as you all know, or many of you probably know. This is the third phase of a multifaceted research series on future trends in business education, um, co-sponsored by AACSB and back in Unicon. In this phase, we conducted web-based interviews with millennials and some Gen Z, or people from what we're calling the digital generation. And the purpose is to learn about their attitudes as prospective students toward aspects of business education. We're looking for some directional predictive indicators, again, directly from prospective students on their expectations for their upcoming education needs. So with that, let me say once again, this the survey instrument, the questionnaire, was developed in collaboration with these three co-sponsors with their respective um, memberships, interests, and target markets. So that means that the survey and report address a broad range of interests, issues that are of interest to all three organizations. And the second thing I want to reassert is that these data represent responses from future prospective students. So as I'm thinking about how the data or the recommendations you'll see at the end, how these uh, relate, to say executive education sales models that may target uh, corporate talent development professionals, CLOs, and identifying um, organizational needs. I'm expecting there may be some overlap with these respondents and talent development professionals, but there may not be complete congruencies for that particular sales model. So we want to keep this in context and, and um, recognize what we can learn from this. Now that said, 
Um, I do believe that as we go through the many layers of this proverbial onion, um, I think we're going to uncover a lot of data that you're going to find will help executive education programs make smart decisions for the future. And I hope that you'll take this report and dig even deeper into the late, those layers of data, especially as it relates to your programs in your context. So that said, let's get into a brief review of the project yourself, itself. Um, we distributed this survey in 10 different countries, translated in five different languages. And again, this was an online survey. Um, when we completed fielding last August, we collected 1,665 responses. And I want to point out one piece of information. Because of the size and diversity of the US market, we designed this project so that about half of the respondents came from the US. These are all important uh, bits of context to help us understand the data. Now, segmenting, excuse me, screening was very important. We wanted to design, we designed this survey to engage the kinds of respondents we most wanted to learn from. So we surveyed respondents aged 21 to 40 and segmented those into two groups for comparison. As I mentioned, we fielded this online survey in 10 different countries and about half of the respondents came from the US. And we included in the survey respondents who at a minimum were currently enrolled in or had already completed university level degrees. Now this next part is very important. We were also interested only in respondents who were predisposed to pursue what we call advanced management education in the next 10 years. So to do that, we provided them a definition of what we considered advanced management education, specifically any type of business or management education beyond the university level, whether or not it leads to a degree or certificate, whether or not it's part of a structured program or just individual courses. We did that to ensure that we engaged a range of respondents regardless of whether uh, the phrase, quote, graduate business education resonated with uh, their visions for their future education needs, um, particularly given some of the um, evolution we've seen recently in the market. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. So after providing this definition, we asked students, or excuse me, respondents, how likely are you to pursue each of these four types of management education options? The, the MBA or master's in business, a specialized master's, business and management courses not part of a formal program, and note that this includes, we in this questionnaire we specify that this includes MOOCs or Coursera, some of the new entrants to the market in, the, in recent years, and of course, non-degree executive education um, as an option. So to be included in the study, on a five point scale, these respondents had to be at least, had to express that they were at least somewhat likely to pursue any one of these management education options. So if they said they were not at all likely or not very likely to pursue, they were screened out of this study. So these are respondents who self identify as being very likely, highly likely to pursue advanced management education in the next 10 years. As we worked with our panel provider and collected data, we found we achieved a fairly well balanced sample in terms of age, in terms of gender. And we learned that about half of our respondents had earned an undergraduate degree and a university degree. Nearly a quarter had reported that they have already earned an MBA or grad degree in business. Now, to start digging into these data. And again, I'd like to frame this. Um, again, this study is intended to include a broad array of management education options and aspects, understanding the preferences and perspectives of future prospective students. So, as we asked students, how likely are you to enroll in one of these four types of advanced management education options in the next 10 years? 
we see that fully 60% of these respondents predisposed toward management education were most interested, top two box, either extremely likely or very likely to pursue the MBA. Um, just under 40% expressed um, high likelihood in pursuing non-degree exec executive education. Um, looking at these data at face value, this may or may not surprise us. A traditional degree like an MBA is still considered the apex, the pinnacle of one's business education journey. And we believe that is a signal that the MBA and a university brand still hold a lot of clout in popular discourse around how to achieve management education. And that speaks to respondents' interest in the strength of the offering for now. As we see in later slides, we believe some shifts are happening in the market that are causing uh, prospects to recognize alternatives for um, renewing their knowledge, renewing their skill sets. And we believe we'll see some erosion of um, the MBA as that pinnacle of management education over the next 10 years. And we'll see the, um, the ramifications of that, particularly as today's 20-somethings arrive at critical career junctures. And that's where we believe that um, the market's going to create opportunities where executive education programs can thrive. So hold on to that thought for just maybe two more slides. And let me uh, parse out these data just a bit for you. Those who were most likely to enroll in executive education tended to be those who have already attained a graduate degree. At least they expressed that at a higher likelihood than those who have a bachelor's degree. And male respondents expressed a slightly stronger interest compared to female respondents. So some items that may um, help frame uh, marketing strategies, communications and outreach strategies. Next, we also investigated some respondents' motivations driving their pursuit of different types of management education. So let me start here on the left with uh, the top three motivations expressed by all respondents, those being improve my or my family's standard of living, improve my leadership or management skills, and provide increased career stability and job security. When we analyzed these data for all respondents, we saw a little disparity between our two age segments, but it was very interesting when we parsed this out by gender, female respondents selected provide increased career stability and job security as their top motivation, not necessarily the case for male respondents. So again, bits of information that may help frame uh, marketing and outreach efforts. Now that said, let's go over here to the right side and look at the top three motivations for pursuing non-degree executive education. Two of the motivations are shared with all respondents, but notice that improving my technical and functional skills floated to the top for respondents who are more likely to pursue executive education. So again, this may help frame um, sales strategy, marketing strategy. Now, let me make a quick note about gender. We believe that there's a lot of data in this report that can help um, inform diversity efforts. Um, and diversity is um, certainly much broader than only gender. I also want to note that as we look at data, that we keep data in context. Data is never a priori. It's always must be situated within context. So it's very important to recognize the complex, um, as they say, intersectionalities of any diversity effort. And bearing in mind um, the um, potential for stereotyping any particular segment or subsegment. So we'll keep that in mind as we continue talking. Now, using this uh, similar question, we wanted to create something of an even playing field, if you will, to compare which management education options are preferred based on different motivations. So we averaged which management education option was selected most on average across all motivations. 
So again, looking at these data at face value, this may or may not completely surprise us. Um, starting with the MBA, which garnered the highest percentage overall across all motivations. Moving around to the specialized masters, executive education, and finally, uh, management courses. And remember what we said before, that management courses was sp specifically noted to include things like MOOCs, Coursera. We hope that people are considering things like Khan Academy or even Linda as they're thinking about um, how these, um, how this relates to their, their um, available options, or at least we expect that that's how they're thinking. Now, when we look at this, one thing that was very interesting to us is that over 40% indicate that non-degree executive education plus courses not part of a formal program are most appropriate across motivations. And that's interesting to us because this is one of several indicators in this study that suggests there are potential inroads for programs, say, executive education open enrollment, which would be considered informal or a non-degree, excuse me, non-graduate degree option. So let me continue on with some other data and we'll, we'll parse this out uh, further as we look at some other data points. We also asked respondents to share their preferences for specific program structures. So we asked respondents to please rank three alternative structures on how, they, how attractive they are in achieving their goals, ranking one as most attractive, three as least attractive. And let me just walk you through this. The options were an established program, and I'm going to read from the questionnaire here, an established program such as one that would be used to earn an MBA at a leading business school. So that's something with a preset curriculum, preset timeline. And now I'm going to move on and just um, uh, for the sake of time, um, paraphrase, just in time, a series of courses that you would uh, use to develop a jointly to develop um, a custom program, a preset curriculum perhaps, but modular so that the student could take it when it suits the student's or the employer's needs. Finally, self-defined or self-directed professional development um, with student-defined curricula or goals and possibly a student-defined timeline. Now here again, we asked respondents to rank these with one being the most attractive. So a lower score is a better score, a higher score, if you will. And significantly, more respondents overall selected self-defined over an established program. And bear in mind that earlier, we said that 60% of these predisposed business, managed, business education prospects were interested in an MBA. Yet at the same time, they're saying that a self-defined program is far more attractive to them than an established program with significance. So this says a number of different things for us. Um, we believe that programs, while the, the MBA has, um, has that um, clout in the industry, we believe that programs that can be customized and self-defined are more attractive than, and um, please forgive my very unrefined metaphor here, than say a cookie cutter MBA, which has become somewhat ubiquitous in the market. Um, we believe that new products and providers in the market are resetting respondents' expectations for what could or should be available to them. And what's interesting to me about this in particular, established programs received more threes than just-in-time and self-defined combined. And also, those respondents who were most likely to pursue the MBA and respondents employed full-time are significantly more interested in self-defined and directed options. So again, we believe that new entrants to the market are helping respondents, helping the market, helping prospective students recognize different options are available to them. Let's look at the same data, just from a slightly different perspective. Um, you'll see that this, this data is organized so according to um, management education options, so for non-degree executive education, this is the percentage of those most likely to pursue executive education who gave established program a one. 
This is the percentage that ranked just in time a one, and this is the percentage that ranked um, self-defined a one. So we're seeing a similar trend here. A greater percentage of those interested in executive education are also interested in self-defined directed. But let me note this for you. Look at how pronounced that distinction is for those that expressed a predilection toward the MBA. We believe this signals opportunity for organizations that provide customizable program, uh, course plans and perhaps even credentials that prospective students would find attractive. And that leads me to my next slide. We also wanted to capture respondents' attitudes towards some new credentialing options that have entered the market in recent years. So we asked, for your professional development, what do you think of the value of certificates or digital badges in helping you reach your goals? Now again, we can parse this data out just a bit and recognize there are some distinctions by gender in particular, but let me show you the larger story here. We asked respondents to tell us their perception of value in terms of these, in terms of certificates or digital badges being a complement to certain programs, a substitute to certain kinds of programs, either a substitute or a complement, or of course not at all, not at all value as either a substitute or complement. Fully 90% plus see some value in certificates and digital badges in reaching their goals. Check out these, um, center, these middle two columns and the data respect, uh, represented here. More than 40% are willing to substitute certificates or digital badges for formal programs. And again, we believe this spells opportunity for university affiliated exec ed programs, those that are able to evolve and provide perhaps their own credentialing options, perhaps built on the foundation of current offerings, using the clout of the university or institutional brand. So once we asked respondents to tell us their perception of the value of these, we asked them straight up, how likely are you to pursue these? And only 10%, only one in 10, say they are um, not so likely to pursue these. What this suggests to us is that certificates and digital badges are gaining currency. And it's not just, we believe, not just the certificate or the digital badge, but also what they represent and the attributes associated with certificates and digital badges that respondents are finding most attractive. With a certificate or digital badge, they can take advantage of those just in time. A certificate or a digital badge allows a student to customize their skill sets, and it allows a, a student to pivot at any point along the career path. Lifelong learning, constant reassessment, and constant ability to change course as needed. So on one hand, um, while the, the MBA still garners a lot of attention and a lot of weight in the industry, there also, there's also something perhaps non-distinct in their, non in their um, ubiquity. So as respondents are seeing the Khan Academies or the Courseras or the MOOCs, and as those are presenting credentialing options, Respondents are seeing opportunities to cherry pick their education options and, and get credit for them. Things that they can put on a resume to customize their personal portfolios of skill sets and represent themselves as unique products. We are also interested in gathering insight into different types of um, pedagogical methods respondents found most effective. So we asked respondents to rate how effective do you personally find these learning approaches from advanced management education? And clearly experiential learning options rose to the top. On-the-job training, hands-on exercises, uh, project-based learning were rated higher than some typical approaches used, case studies, seminars, lectures. Um, and again, we believe this is a signal that programs that are able to continually evolve 
and incorporate experiential learning methods, those will garner attention in the market. Next, we sought to um, gain insight into course delivery options that these respondents preferred. So first we set the stage. We asked respondents about their experiences with online options. Have you ever taken an online blended course? And the vast majority of future prospects has experience with online or blended courses. And this may or may not surprise people. 54%, um, more than half, have completed at least one online or blended course. An additional 21% started have started an online or blended course but never completed one. So that's 75% of the market that has experience with online or blended courses. We expect much of that probably comes from prior educational experience, perhaps even going back to high school, certainly through um, associate and bachelor programs. Now, given that, we asked respondents their preferences for live, pre-recorded, or a mix of live and pre-recorded delivery options, course delivery options. And by a rather slim margin, the mix of uh, live and pre-recorded attracts a comparatively a slightly larger proportion of interest of, of the population. But I want you to note that live still attracts, again, a comparatively large proportion of respondents. This suggests to us that, and this may not be surprising, there's a lot of comfort with online options, synchronous and asynchronous. These provide flexibility that would be preferred, as many, much of the data in this study indicates, flexibility preferred by full-time employees and certainly respondents looking to manage their lifestyles in an ever increasingly um, busy world. At the same time, programs that can provide live, perhaps even face-to-face -face interactions, along with online and pre-recorded content, those may retain or even capture greater attention from the market. Face-to-face, -face, perhaps, but certainly live, still retains some cachet and value. Now, with all that in mind, we can also recognize some distinctions by segment. Um, for instance, female respondents in this study prefer certain delivery options um, certain, compared to male respondents, um, certainly appreciating pre-recorded instruction more compared to male respondents, for instance. And that may speak to um, certain perspectives or attitudes toward time management, interactions with work, interactions with family, and their preferences in engaging in the various um, uh, spheres of their lives. Similarly, our older 30-something-year-old age segment preferred the mix of instruction significantly more than the 20-something segment. Um, and I'm going to touch on this just very briefly, but um, these data are important in and of them themselves. But I'd like us to remember once again that data always happens in context. In context, more and more, as we're seeing, as audiences become more and more fractured, um, these may be indicators for the value of micro-targeting. Given that, for instance, um, female respondents prefer pre-recorded instruction significantly, within the context of all of this data, I'd like us to be mindful that individuals, I'd like us to be mindful of um, the potential for stereotyping is um, what I'd like to say. Here again, some data that may or may not be surprising, but certainly validates what some of us might already believe in the market. We ask respondents to tell us how much say do you wanna have in your professional development plans. Half of respondents say they want to steer the course, the direction of their professional careers and their education plans. And this is driven by some extent to our older age segment. Um, again, and similarly, we have data that suggests that female respondents are less likely to pursue 
uh, prefer having their employers drive their personal education plans. Again, this, this resonates in our minds, this resonates with what other data are saying. Given what respondents see in the market, not only do they want to define their professional plans, their education plans, we believe this signals that respondents see that the tools are out there for them to do so. And this last data slide is very important, I think, especially for university affiliated programs we asked respondents to indicate the likelihood to pursue for-profit institutions compared to not-for-profit or state-sponsored institutions. Well, just under a third expressed the preference for um, non-profit institutions. Nearly half expressed equal preference for for-profit or not-for-profit institutions. And when we add that to the 23% who expressed interest in for-profit institutions, this 23% plus this 46% represents about 70, just shy of 70% of the market that's expressing some comfort with for-profit management education providers. And what's interesting is that we're seeing this particularly driven by our 20-something age segment. Now these data might surprise some of us, um, particularly um, for those of us who might question the, the cost-benefit ratio that for-profit programs provide, um, quality issues, etc. But looking at this from a prospective student's perspective, in some ways for-profits are low cost and low risk. In some way, uh, for many of them, um, acceptance standards are lower. In most, in many cases, costs are lower, and at least at the face of it, risk can be perceived to be lower for prospects. Now, another influence we believe is probably driving this is the um, the rise, the ascendancy of the Strayers and Capellas. In the last year or so, Stray and Capella announced a merger which would result in a probably two point, two point something billion dollar organization. And that's going to have a fair amount of industry influence. And we've been seeing indications in the media that for-profits are addressing some of their quality, is quality issues. They're using um, assurance of learning data to confirm the value of their products, of their offerings. So what that tells us is that um, for-profits have been learning from your playbook and they've had some success because more and more uh, prospective students, particularly these younger generations of students, are expressing more and more comfort with for-profit institutions. So in summary, what can we expect to see from prospective students in the next decade or so? We believe that Established programs like the MBA will still have a lot of clout in the market, but perhaps not as much as past generations, particularly as 20-somethings, again, approach those um, critical career forks in the road. And bear in mind that data that may seemingly be contradictory at the face of it actually reflects some evolution in the marketplace. 60% of respondents saying they're interested in that MBA, yet, those are also those respondents are also significantly more likely to rank self-defined as their number one choice in educational plan structure. We're seeing that prospects are becoming more comfortable with the idea of alternative credentials, and they're also looking for opportunities to help them manage their lifestyles, full-time workloads with flexibility, customizability, and hands-on experience. We believe that prospects are seeing the market provide more and more ways they can customize and personalize their uh, personal skill sets, their personal portfolios and res resumes, and they want that. And they're finding comfort with the credibility of a wider range of providers in the market. So what can we do about that? 
And I, I want to say again, um, this is with respect for the fact that many executive education sales models um, focus on the perspectives of talent development, corporate talent development professionals. But what these data are telling us first, that remember that for profit, while for profits are um, gaining currency, university affiliated exec ed programs can take advantage of the brand clout they have today and continue to build a case for the value of their products by demonstrating results. Again, using assurance of learning data, um, implementing student surveys that show return on investment or student satisfaction. Um, we believe that those prog programs that thrive will be those programs that can continue to evolve, building portfolios of offerings that perhaps are built on what you offer today and yet will draw the interest of prospects who are looking for flexibility, customizability, experiential learning, alternative credentials. Now, that said, I also respect that um, there could be some pain points for university-affiliated executive education programs as they prepare for the future. We believe that those programs that can prepare for agility and recognize that pivoting must now be planned into strategy, those will be the programs that thrive best. So we hope that you are able to um, do the work now to gain the buy-in of key stakeholders. Consider weaving micro-marketing efforts into recruitment plans if that's not already present. And again, given, in, given the context of your current sales models, and continue continuously refreshing your portfolios of options, um, perhaps leveraging current offerings with complementary credentials that um, have lower financial and time commitment requirements compared to some traditional offerings that um, offer self-directed course plans or formats and certainly offer flexibility. And bearing in mind that some, if, if and when programs are able to develop these complementary cr credentials or offerings, these could function as feeders into your uh, tradition, your base product offering or follow-ups to your base product offering. I'm hopeful that um, these data can help us all think together about how we can um, thrive in the future and um, I'm very interested in your questions and your comments. So Rob, I think from there, I will uh, finally just say one more time, this is a very dense report, and I'm very hopeful that now that we've kind of taken a um, 35,000 foot level look at the data, you're able to dig into deeper and deeper layers of the data, take the report back to your programs, and talk about what does this mean in our particular context with our market, our clients' needs. Rob? Thank you, Joyce. So helpful to have you guide us through these really interesting and insightful uh, findings. Um, at this point, we will open it up to the group for questions and answers. Just a reminder, please submit your questions through your navigation panel in the question box, and we'll be able to share those with both Joyce and Meg and Monica for their insight and responses. Um, Joyce, while we're awaiting some of the, the questions from our, uh, our audience today, a couple of quick observations. As you were leading us through this presentation, one thing I was wondering is, is there a duration for these generational shifts? Um, I can think back to when we were all talking about Gen X and Gen Y, and now we're at, at Gen Z and the millennials. Do you get a sense for how long these, these trends, is there a duration or a shelf life for, for what you're finding in this most, in this most recent research? You know, that's a great question, and um, the, um, the, of course the answer is yes and no. Um, my short answer is, given the constant evolution in the market, I would expect this report, in all frankness, um, probably has a shelf life of five to six, seven years. Mm -hmm. so, because I expect with technological, technological shifts, um, constant technological shifts, um, 
shifts in um, cultural discourse, political discourse, economic shifts, the, the um, encroaching uh, gig economy, those, uh, some of those will be quite unpredictable in terms of how mm -hmm. they manifest. So, and, and again, um, as we all know, change happens at exponentially more rapid uh, paces. So that is my short answer. I would love to hear Meg's or Monica's perspectives from a, a practitioner's perspective. Okay, uh, Joyce, I would say it probably even has a shorter lifespan, this study, the shelf life might be shorter, because mm -hmm. what I see here is a lot of uh, um, a market that is in turmoil, things are changing, but many of the answers here do not reflect what we're seeing in actual purchase practices as mm -hmm. to because I think one thing is an intent and the other one is where you want to put your money and invest your resources. And what we're seeing here is probably a future trend, what people expect they will want, but we don't know what they will really want or not. So we put, should probably revisit this more sooner, uh, sooner than later. I would say even three years might make a huge difference because what we're delivering, the micro-credentialing, everything is changing so fast that perceptions might change. Right now, I would be willing to bet that a lot of the people who answer their survey were answering with little knowledge about what is really out there, what their options are, but more and, people are, more, and more people are becoming aware of that now. So I think this could change faster. I'll agree and um, say that, and just add that I see these data as being directional, as mm -hmm. I mentioned early on. I, um, I think um, predictive studies, as, as you indicated very well, um, predictive studies can be a challenge, particularly um, with how quickly change is happening in the market, again, technologically, culturally, economically. So um, I think you make very fine points. Go ahead, Rob. And we do have some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, thanks to Laura Keeler for submitting. A really interesting slide on the type of course delivery preferred, live versus pre-recorded versus mix. Uh, Laura's wondering if you have those same stats just for those that said they were interested in executive education. And do you know how much overlap there is between someone who has received an MBA and is also interested in pursuing executive education? Okay. Um, my answer to both parts of that question are, um, yes, we do have that data. And in, in fact, I'm happy to go back up to that slide. Um, we, we don't see, there's a certain margin of error, as we all know, with um, quantitative studies. And um, those who are more likely to pursue executive education, um, they're um, differential, the, excuse me, their response distribution looked very similar to all respondents. Um, so kind of as all respondents go, so goes executive education. Um, now the second part of that is how does that compare to uh, those most interested in MBA? I don't have those stats in front of me just now, but I'd be happy to take a look at that. And if you want to shoot me an email, I can see if I can respond to that half of the question a little more specifically. Okay. And another question, Vicki Maris asks, are you seeing hiring supervisors and employers in general recognizing credentials and badges versus certificate programs or full MBAs? Well, why don't I respond first? Um, and then I, I think Meg and Monica might be best to um, respond to this with their anecdotal, their um, observations of the market from their perspectives. Um, again, this this study won't will not does not address um, hiring managers or talent development professionals, unfortunately. So I can't respond to that from this study, and I don't have specific data to address that question directly. But I bet there is anecdotal evidence that could help us um, um, kind of understand the picture for what's happening out there. Meg or Monica, what do you think of that? So um, this is this is Meg. I would say um, the 
the, the data we saw in this report showing that there is a really high value placed on hands-on classroom learning on the job training uh, is evidence to the fact that the, the kind of the proof is in the pudding for folks when they're taking these types of programs here at MIT we focus a lot on application um, and uh, action learning project-based learning and my anecdotal uh, observation would be that the value is seen when there's when the 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 folks who have taken the the program or the course are able to do something differently when they go back to work um i i'd like to I, I agree with you meg but uh i'm in a different market as you know i am in latin america which is only represented by brazil in this study and i would say we're still not there that's why I said what we're seeing in practice and the intent, are, I'm still not seeing the reflection. There's a lot of value for employers still to have the credential coming from the university, not the micro-credentialing, and they see it away as sort of pre-filtering candidates. We'll see, we still see a lot of difference uh, in the hiring depending on the degree and where it's coming from. Thank you both. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, just a reminder again, please use your question panel on your navigation pane um, while we're waiting for additional questions. Uh, going back to the, the delivery models, uh, it, it seemed as though the, the mix model was coming out slightly ahead. Joyce, do you have any sense, is there a, a breakdown? Can you give us any definition beyond that level? What type of a ratio of, of live to pre-recorded might be uh, ideal or is there any preference for the, the, the ratio of, of both live and pre-recorded in the mix category? You know, that's a great question and that is a level of granularity that we did not pursue in this study. Now what I can tell you, because as many of you know, Percept um, manages benchmarking studies for associations like Unicon and other um, higher ed associations out there. Um, I can speak from the program perspective that um, more and more programs are experimenting with that mix right now. So I, again, I, I think that's still in the evolution stage and will continue to evolve. But we're seeing um, right now around 20 to 30% online either asynchronous or synchronous. That's kind of, that's kind of a ballpark where we're seeing a number of programs ex, uh, fall in terms of the, ex, the continuous experiment and what kind of mix should we have. And I trust that they came to that mix or they're in that ballpark right now because of what they're seeing in their local, in their respective markets. Mm -hmm. One thing that you mentioned a few times throughout is, is some of the insight that you gained in terms of um, maybe some of the, the differences in the segments and, and particularly around genders. Was there anything as you went through this research, research that really surprised you in terms of some of these segments, whether it be age-based or gender-based that you that kind of surprised you in terms of the findings? Um, you know, and I hope this doesn't come off, <laughs> I hope this doesn't come off as obsequious, but I was a little bit surprised to see um, that the disparity between likelihood to pursue an MBA and likelihood to pursue exec education. Um, I expected exec education to come out a little bit higher, to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. However, um, what I also know about this study, and you'll see this in the report, is that um, something like, oh, what was it, 40% of our respondents have zero to five years of, just under 40%, I think, um, of our respondents have zero to five years work experience. So executive education may not quite be on their radar, for one thing. Uh, what that says to me is that there's opportunity for messaging. There's opportunity for educating the market about what's available to them, particularly and if um, exec ed programs uh, build out their portfolios of offerings to um, engage um, to be engaging with individual student prospects. Great. Well, we don't seem to have any more questions from the audience. Uh, any final thoughts you'd like to make before we close? 
just to encourage people, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, you will have a copy of the slide deck, and um, you can reach me at survey support dot at per perceptresearch.com or joyce.kerpiers at perceptresearch.com. And I'll be happy when I send you this slide deck. Um, to, I'm speaking to the admin, pe admin people. I'll ensure that I include my email address on the slide deck so people have that. Great. And we did actually get one final question, I think, for today. What was the rationale behind not serving those over 40? Right? Uh, well, partially because we're asking prospective students to tell us what they're going to do in the next 10 years. Um, and as people who are currently 40, as they're looking in the next 10 years, um, we decided that that was a segment. Uh, the, the three uh, co-sponsoring institutions decided collectively that that was a, an age segment that would produce um, less, less um, um, perhaps less insight for their need, given their needs. And um, we wanted to maximize the respondent sample that we had. And 1,600 responses is a great large sample size. And we really wanted to concentrate that to learn most about what was happening with the millennial generations, less with um, the later Gen X or, and uh, earlier generations. Yeah, I think what you said at last is really it. Uh, as this is a joint study, as of course, we as executive education providers know that people with zero to five years experience is really not our target. It's not what we're, we're looking for. So the 40 year olds are a lot more interesting for us. However, this was a joint study Right. that looked for the audience that we all share, in our case, the 30 to 40 years old might be more interesting than the 20 to 30, but it was around the millennials. I think that's what it is. It's not that the others would not provide insight. We wanted to know what the millennials are thinking. Thank you. Great. Maybe we can cover 40 plus in, in a phase four at some point. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your hard work and preparation and your time today and sharing Again, this, this great insight and research. Hopefully our Unicon audience today found it valuable. And as a reminder, we will be posting the slides to the Unicon website. So as Joyce mentioned, please refer to the, the slide deck yourself or share it with colleagues. You'll be receiving a link to the recording of this webinar. Share that as well with your colleagues that may not have been able to join. Uh, but on, on behalf of the Unicon Communications Committee, Joyce, I'd like to thank you for, for your time today and Meg and Monica for your input as well. Uh, we will be planning additional webinars for uh, later in the year, so please stay tuned for details. And uh, thank you again to the Unicon audience for joining us today. Thank you all.